Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll meet one of the candidates vying for the position of the new FM Symphony conductor. But first, joining me now is a guest from Oaks, North Dakota, Rebecca Ford. And we're going to be talking about your new book, Beyond the Eyes. But before we get to the book, uh, Rebecca, tell the folks a little bit about yourself and your background, where you're originally from. Well, I was actually born in um, Ohio, Cincinnati to be exact, and then after my parents divorced and my mom remarried, she moved me and my sister to Phoenix, Arizona. So I grew up there, and then from there I moved to Prescott, lived there for a while, and then six years ago we moved here. And um, I come from an interesting background, actually, because when my parents were married, they were um, the directors of the UFO Investigators League in um, Fairfield, Ohio. And they also investigated um, paranormal activity, ghost hauntings, and Bigfoot sightings. So, hmm. yeah. Interesting. Well, what got you started in writing? I just love, I've loved books since I was a kid. And writing, I guess it's in my blood because my aunt, my great aunt writes too. So, and I just love telling stories. So, okay. yeah. Well, let, let's talk about uh, your new book that's out, mm -hmm. it's, uh, Beyond the Eyes. Uh, mm -hmm. What's it about? What's about? Well, actually, it's about um, good and evil, but it's not linear. It has everything in it. It has um, romance, it has love triangles, it has horror, it has friendship, it has heartache, it has all that. But um, basically, the um, main character is 17 year old Paige Reed. And she's been hearing a ghostly voice whisper haunting premonitions to her since she was four years old. And you would think that she would tell her friends about it, her best friends, but she was afraid that um, they would, they would, their opinion would change of her. So she's never told anybody about um, this ghostly voice whispering these premonitions. Well, one day it whispers a uh, um, haunting premonition about her. And all of a sudden, everything changes. Um, paranormal paranormal um, occurrences happen in her life. Strangers seem to know and detest her. And Paige feels more alone than ever because she has nobody to talk about, but then to, to tell. And then um, she meets Nathan Caswell. And when she meets him, there's like this magnetic energy that draws them to each other. And at first she doesn't know this, but Nathan is actually no ordinary guy. He, um, he's a tractor of dark spirits. He tracks dark spirits. And he, he becomes alarmed when he notices that there are dark spirits that um, don't like her. There's a light within her that they hate and they want to kill her. And then there are these two power hungry dark spirits who want something from Paige. And anyways, what they want is King Solomon's ring. See, when Paige's dad was alive, he was close to discovering King Solomon's ring. And if you look it up on the internet, there's an actual legend that um, St. Michael, the archangel, gave King Solomon this ring. And whoever wears this ring can control, well, they say demons, but in my book, it's dark spirits. However, in my book, you have to have the incantations too in order to um, have it work. So you have to find a ring first and then the incantations. So anyways, the, um, these two power hungry dark spirits thinks that Paige can find it for them. So they corner her. And if she doesn't comply, they're gonna kill her. So it forces her to, to um, dig deep into her father's past. And she discovers um, shocking information about her father and his bloodline. And then, um, to make a long story short, she has she only knows of two things in her life at that point, that she's completely and helplessly in love with Nathan, and that she needs to outwit the dark spirits in order to stay alive. Hmm. Well, I noticed uh, right after the acknowledgments, you, you, you have a page here with Psalm 23, verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Right. Significance of that, starting the book out? Right, right, because like I said, it's good um, versus evil. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. And uh, how did you get the idea to start, uh, to come this up book? with it? Yeah, to start the book. I have so many ideas stuffed in my head. And one day I was telling Kevin, my husband, I'm like, I want to write a book. I already wrote one book, but it's never been published. But anyways, I want to write a story, but I don't, 
I can't figure out which story to write. And Kevin said, write something that scares the crap out of you. Well, the movie The Exorcist always scared me, and it still does. So I took that idea and my own idea, and I meshed it together to create To Be On The Eyes. Okay. Was it hard getting started writing uh, the, the book itself? Um, the beginning part, I rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it because it's supposed to grab the reader, you know, as soon the first line, you know, and they say the first chapter. That was the hard part. But after that, things just started flowing. You know, characters started popping up that I didn't even think about before. And it's just lots of surprises, you know. It's just fun writing. Sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, tell us about getting published. It, it, is that, I mean, I know sometimes uh, people say it's difficult, but is that easier now or is there still, what are, what are the obstacles to overcome there? I think it's harder now because um, I think the publishers are more picky about it. And um, I thought about going the traditional route and I did have um, received good reviews and stuff from agents and all that, but they either, their, their client list was full or they weren't, um, you know, they didn't take on clients with this type of book. I did have an agent that was in, that was um, interested in it, but then she became unreliable. Not that I don't love agents or the publishing companies. I totally respect them, but I'm less like, okay, what can I do? I need to get this published. Well, I decided to, I decided to self-publish. I did um, all the research, and there are so many benefits to that because you have your your creativity, you keep your own creativity. Nobody can tell you, no, you can't do this, you can't do that. You can write what you want, you keep most of your royalties. Your book becomes, you know, immortal, basically. You know, they're never gonna get yanked off the shelves. So, just so many benefits to it, so. Well, now, understand this is your first longer form book, I guess I'll call it that. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about some of your past uh, writings? Well, I wrote this other book that I didn't publish called um, Through the Looking Glass. And it was about a um, girl who tried to commit suicide and she, she um, meets her guide and um, Morden's his name and he's, he's um, Celtic, you know, and he, he takes her to, um, well, people would say heaven, but um, yeah, he takes her to a different realm and basically travels through all the different places and stuff like that. It's a spiritual book, basically. Okay. Well, you mentioned your parents earlier, and, mm -hmm. and uh, can you talk about the influence they had since they were uh, paranormal investigators? Yeah, they, they taught us how to, um, well, keep an open mind, you know what I mean? And so my, my dad taught me a lot about um, you know, the evidence. You can't just take things at face value. Like if somebody says, oh, I was abducted by an alien or I've been, you know, um, experiment on or, you know what I mean? You can't take things at face value. You have to investigate. And um, he taught me a lot about that instead of not being gullible, you know what I mean? So um, I learned a lot from him, okay. you know, in that aspect. Well, can you talk about some of their findings over the years? I, and were they involved with this for a long time? Yeah, well, it was back in the 70s. But even after they divorced, um, the paranormal was prevalent in our life. But um, we did, when they were doing that, we did have a house that was um, haunted. So they decided to um, investigate. Well, they, they wanted to make sure if it was haunted or not. So they... Um, took a tape recorder. Well, back then it was real to real, I think. But anyways, they turned it on at night and they went to sleep and the next morning they, um, they played it back and it sounded like a party going on in our house. And my mom looked at my dad and she's like, what are we gonna do? And my dad's like, I don't care as long as they clean up the mess, you know? He's just like being silly about it. So they took that tape and had it professionally um, you know, looked at and stuff, you know, had the forensic stuff or whatever they do. And so the guy, he's the top um, parapsychologist back then. I cannot remember his name, and I know my dad's probably screaming out his name right now as he sees this, but, but anyways, he tested it, and he said, this is the um, best recording I've ever encountered in my career. So that was one thing. I mean, they've did, a, they've, investigated other things too as well. I mean, that was our own personal thing, but he had 
other investigations that he did, you know, okay. from other people. When, uh, has he uh, been supportive in your writings about the paranormal? Very much so. He was very, very supportive. In fact, he called me last night to tell me he supports me. <laughs> All right. Obviously, uh, you've been around it, uh, I guess, most of your life. Mm -hmm. But do you believe in paranormal, ghost hauntings and such? Yeah, I do. I mean, I don't think all of them are, you know, paranormal sightings or whatever. I think there's logical explanations for it. But I do, I do believe that there are, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think certain people have uh, psychic powers to connect with uh, other uh, worlds or, or mm -hmm. you know, people that have passed away? I think so. But then again, there are charlatans and stuff like that, people who try to pull the wool over other people's eyes and stuff like that. But I do think that there are some. Mm -hmm. well, you know, as, um, as your book right here, I mean, it, it's about a, a teenager, a young mm -hmm. person. I mean, is your book aimed toward younger audience, young teen readers, or is it reach a broader appeal with this book? It's a young adult paranormal book, so yeah, you would think that it's aimed to the um, teenagers, but also um, a, it's, um, for a broader audience too. It has crossover potential. I mean, I've had people that are my age or older who've read it and absolutely love it, which is good, you know. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, obviously, well, I, maybe you already, okay, why do you like writing about paranormal and fantasy type literature? Because I grew up in it. And, <laughs> yeah. and you know, what's cool is because I grew up in it, I have the knowledge, I have the experience, and I can weave it into my books. Well, with that said, because uh, we've had other authors on, what advice do you have for young writers or potential authors out there? I have never give up for one. If that's your passion, you have to read, 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 and write. Just keep writing and write what you love. You know, don't pay attention to what's out there in the market, what's popular, because nobody knows for, you know, the next day or the next year if that's going to be popular. Just write what you love because it will show in your writing. If you write to try to please other people, then it's not going to show in your writing and you're not going to have that passion, that fire in your belly. So just write what you love and don't give up. Just keep writing and get critique partners too because you may think that um, everything is, you know, A-OK -okay or whatever, but they'll catch things that you haven't caught, you know. And then if you're going to self-publish, you need an editor too. Okay, so yeah, so but never give up. And well, I, I hear you saying write maybe what you know about too, or just yeah. Yeah, you know. they can write what they know about too, whatever. And if they don't know about something, but they're passionate about something, say mythology and stuff like that, because I love mythology, but I'm not an expert or anything on it. But I have a mythological book, you know, a dictionary and stuff on my desk that I can refer back to it. So if you're interested in something and you have that passion, but you're not familiar with it still write because you could do the research and stuff just like I did with Solomon's Ring. I didn't really know much about it but I did the research and it's an actual legend so in a sense you know it could be you know you could be like whoa this could be true <laughs> you know so yeah just do the research. When I understand uh, this would I call this a trilogy? I mean this is your first book of a series. Right right it's a three book series. Okay so uh, is where are you in the second and third book right now? The second book's written and right now I'm working with my editor. So, and then um, after that, and I'm working with my cover artists and stuff like that. So then after that, it'll be published. And my third book, The Devil's Third, is halfway written, the rough draft is. And I have a critique partner that I'm working with as I'm writing it, I'm sending her the chapters. And it's cute too, because she's like, hurry up with the next chapter, you know, I can't wait to read it. So, yeah, I'm doing that too. So, uh, again, so you obviously uh, your second book is, uh, I understand, ent entitled Dark Spirits. Uh -huh. And uh, now, when you had the first one done, how quickly did you start the second one? Or were you writing them both a little bit simultaneously? Or, or do you have an outline? How do, yeah, how do you write a series of books and keep the continuity and all the characters in line and everything like that? You know, I tried doing an outline and I wish that I could do an outline because there's so many writers that can do an outline and follow it. I could have like a rough outline, 
but basically it's in my head and I just start writing it but then I'll write down you know the ideas that I have so I could go back to it and there's that continuity and stuff like that so that's what I did with the first book and then um, to answer your question I did the first book first and then I started the second book and in the first book I have what they call um, red herrings or whatever where there's um, clues and then I intertwine those clues to the second book so then when the reader reads the second book they're like oh that's why or whatever and that's what I'm doing with the third book but the third book I'm writing that right now too as I'm doing these so I'm kind of doing a juggling act mm -hmm. with that so at the end of like book one book two is are they cliffhangers does it leave you hanging mm -hmm. or does it sort of have an ending point and it just picks back up in the, in the series cliffhangers okay <laughs> <laughs> I know that probably annoys some people too like man I have this one girl that read my book and she loved it which is good and she's like hey I can't wait for dark spirits you know okay. so, so uh, obviously the first book is out mm -hmm. uh, what, what do you feel like the reactions been so far it's been good I mean um, I've received four and five star reviews which is really good and stuff I did receive a couple you know not so good reviews but that's expected I mean every artist gets bad and good reviews but yeah I've had people come up to me and say they love my book and I can't wait for the next one and everything so it's a good feeling so mm -hmm. yeah so uh, how are you promoting it and uh, yeah everything I have my own blog the amusing um, writer dot blogspot dot com mm -hmm. um, the Facebook Pinterest Goodreads Goodreads is awesome if anybody loves books go to Goodreads they're awesome um, book bloggers those people are awesome too because they'll read your book just you know because they love books you send your book they'll read it and they'll do a review um, I did a podcast for the first time in my life and um, a book signing mm -hmm. at Sweets and Stories so and then this so anything I can do that's what I've been doing so do you think social media then has helped uh, people like you trying to get uh, oh, yeah. books so, noticed and right and I'm still learning the whole marketing thing I know there's still a lot of things you got to do you know um, but yeah I'm, just, I'm new at this I'm still learning but yeah social media I think is helps tremendously you know who are some of the authors or writers that, that influenced you well um, Anne Rice growing up I read Anne Rice's books her vampire trilogies and stuff I love how she writes um, I love George Orwell 1984 mm -hmm. You know, um, it's funny because Stephen King, I never read his books, really. I watched his movies growing up and stuff like that, the movies made from his book. But then um, I read his, I started reading The Stand and stuff, and I really like Stephen King, too. So, yeah, those are my influences, basically. Okay. Well, then, w when is the release of Dark Spirits uh, scheduled? I'm not sure yet. I think at the beginning of next, next um, year, okay. I'm guessing. And then you think the third one would follow a year later, or probably at the end of next year. At the end of next year. Yeah. So then they'll all be out and available for everybody. Yep. Okay. Uh, I guess it, it, again, you've talked some about it, but if people want more information, or uh, you know, where is where can they get your book? Uh, who can they contact? Where can they go? Where can they go? They could go to Amazon.com. They could go to Smashwords, and they could go to Barnes and Noble. What do you? Dot com. Okay. <laughs> Last question here is, what do you hope people get out of reading your book? I hope that they, um, they get entertainment, basically. That's because, you know, so many people work so hard and they have families and stuff like that. They need to have me time, you know, and I want to give them that um, pocket of time where it's just them and they have that, um, that um, entertainment factor and they could just be stuck in you know sucked into a story and just forget about all the the stuff that's been going on in their life you know and um, I want them to know you know through this too, just um, just believe in yourself you know what I mean and um, follow your heart you know Becca thanks so much for joining us today okay, thank you stay tuned for more The Fargo-Moorhead Symphony Orchestra is in the process of hiring a new conductor to lead the talented group of musicians who make up the orchestra. Here's a profile of one of the finalists. A 
as someone who grew up here, I treasure my experiences here. I think that the, 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 the experiences I had and the people who inspired me and influenced me are the ingredients that injected themselves into my development, into my dreams. I went out and I accomplished many of those things. Some of them, I, I, I honestly didn't think that I'd ever be able to, to do them. I mean, conduct in Carnegie Hall, conduct the New York Philharmonic, conduct opera in Berlin and Vienna, and to spend much of my creative life in Europe at the heart of where we think about where classical music as we know it really formed itself. When I saw an opportunity to, to come back here, I, I viewed it as a, a, a real chance for me to, to, to take everything that I had learned and just share it. Just try the violins right there. This is after that little fermata, the Allegramente. I was born in Iowa City, moved to Milwaukee, and then when my father uh, took the, the band job uh, with Concordia in 1967, it was with the stipulation that he'd be allowed to start an orchestra. I was at Morehead High School. I had been persuading my parents for years that it was okay that I was only practicing the piano, you know, an hour a day, because I was going to become a, a doctor. Let's play it right at the beginning. Yum, pa pa pum, pa pa pum, pa pa pum, pum pum pa. Here is a one, two, three. I remember when I came home as a senior and told my parents that I was going to become a music major at Concordia. They just kind of slumped down in their chairs and were rather saddened by that. I devoted myself um, for the next several years to the piano and spent you know many hours every day trying to make up for what what should have been a devotion in the teenage years that I didn't really put forth. I came home one night after, I don't know, three, four hours of practicing, 10 o'clock at night, I, I put on a, a recording without really looking at it. It turned out it was Mahler's first symphony. And by the end of the first movement, I had decided that's what I was going to do. I would become a, a conductor. I truly have been enriched by my experiences. Everywhere I went, I learned from orchestras. And that's, that's the key thing. It's not conductors going around uh, telling what people how to do things. It's definitely a two-way street. And I have to say, it's been the same this week here. I'm learning from the musicians, and I'm really thrilled with how this orchestra has developed over the years. I am truly impressed with these musicians. They are truly dedicated and want to work very hard. And we have been. We've worked uh, extremely hard. They have shown me some extraordinary musicianship. And this, to me, I see as an enormous opportunity. First, Fargo-Moorhead has this tremendous asset in terms of this organization. It's solidly uh, supported. The board works very hard. They have a wonderful staff and these musicians are truly devoted to their craft. I'm grateful that Fargo-Moorhead has continued to decide to support an organization like uh, the FM Symphony, of which you can be very, very proud. After I knew that I would be coming here, they asked if I would um, submit several programs based on potential soloists. I drew up a German program, since that's where most of my second upbringing has been in Vienna and in, in Germany, especially in the Opera House. I did a, a program that featured some American music, and I did a Russian program. Each one could sort of stand on its own, but I also wanted to give everyone an idea of how I might be thinking about a, an entire season as well. You have to look at the program and say, all right, we need a piece on there that everybody's gonna be comfortable with and is gonna say, I love that piece. I'm going to go to that concert to hear that piece. And now it might also be the soloist. I don't see any reason not to have at least one work on a program that's unusual. We have a balance in this program where 
hopefully a potential listener will come see one piece on the program where he says, oh, I love that piece. So he's, he comes with one favorite work and he'll leave with two or maybe even three. That's the ideal formula, in my view, of how to build a, a single program. The Fargo-Moorhead Symphony is searching for its next music director. This season, our Masterworks concerts will each be led by one of the five finalists. The decision of who will be the next artistic leader will involve valuable input from the orchestra musicians, audience members, symphony supporters, students, and members of the community, including you. The countdown begins. Who will be the Fargo-Moorhead Symphony's next conductor? Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week, and as always, Thanks for watching. Funding for Minnesota Legacy programs are provided by a grant from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. North Dakota Council on the Arts and by the members of Prairie Public.